God, we thank you that you are such a great and awesome God, that you rule over all things, that you're in control of the weather, that you're in control of everything. And we acknowledge that this morning. And we even thank you for the snow, Lord. For we know that you carry us day in and day out, no matter, no matter what the weather conditions, no matter what our heart condition is, you look over us and you watch out for us and you seek our best. Lord, help us to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to encourage one another here this morning to uh, say what you would have us say, to learn what you'd have us learn, to be with Dave as he brings your word and, and help us to take these words of truth to heart. For your words are truth and they are life to us. And help us to apply it that we might live more fully for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning I'm going to do something a little different um, based on uh, the circumstances of this uh, past week. Uh, and the title of my message this morning, and you have your outline, you can follow with me, it's called Why a Christian Worldview. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that, and I, th and I hope you can use this uh, as you seek to defend uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that you come in contact with. Uh, here's a good question for you this morning. How many of you uh, were able to watch uh, that debate this week that took place? You realize what the ultimate issue was is, can I trust the Word of God? And that's what it is. That is the true and genuine question. Can I truly trust the Word of God as God has given it to me, or is there something more that I need to know? Is there something more within the realm of science that has yet to debunk this whole notion of God and who He is? And when I think about the Christian developing the worldview and his or her worldview, I often think of the game Jenga. Charles, can you slow me down just a tad bit, please? Thank you. I think about the game Jenga. How many of you ever played Jenga? Raise your hand. Okay, two of you. All right. <laughs> you, know, you know what the purpose of the game is, right? So you have this block, but it's broken up into multiple blocks. And the purpose of this game Jenga is to keep taking out pieces until the last person that does it ends up falling and they end up losing the game. And often what I think about when I think about the game Jenga is the Christian worldview. It has many components to it and we're going to go over these components. Here's what I plan on doing this morning is to equip you with answers that you can use to defend the Christian faith. Obviously I'm not going to get into everything but I'm just going to give you foundationally what you need in order to defend the Christian faith. But I think about the game Jenga and I think about the fact that in our culture today, there are many Christians who believe that you can start to take out pieces from the Christian faith and still be Christian. You see what I'm saying? When you start to say, well, you know, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, yeah, that is absolutely important. We're, we're going to keep that piece in there. But when you start thinking about, well, is the Word of God truly true and genuine? Can I trust every, every single word? What do Christians start to do? They start to take out little pieces and say... Yeah, maybe this book, but maybe not that book. And when we start to negotiate, we start to what we simply end up doing is we start to take away multiple pieces from the foundation of what God has given to us to the point where we have no foundation to stand on. And I'm going to go over some couple of different things that I help, hope will uh, help you explain the Christian faith as you seek to reach the lost or with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about this issue called the worldview. What is the definition of a worldview? It simply means this, the overall perspective from which we, one sees and interprets the world. So for a Christian, you and I look at the world today and we are to interpret it and look at the circumstances and situations from the Word of God. Can I explain the things around me? Can I explain people groups? Can I explain sin? Can I explain demographics? Can I explain death and suffering? Can I do this from a Christian perspective. So when I say that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and that I'm a Christian, my worldview does not come from man's opinion. It comes from the authority, which is ultimately God Himself. So that is how I explain the Christian faith. But you and I realize that we live in a very pluralistic world, right? You look all around us, there are people of different religions. <clears throat> Genuinely, you ask yourself, well, Dave, there's a lot of quote-unquote good people within these religions how can you possibly say that the Bible and Christianity is the only way to God? But what about all these genuine and sincere people? What about them? And we're going to tackle this issue because if you and I are truly passionate about reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are going to come across people of different faiths. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever had a conversation with a Muslim, 
Buddhist or Hindu person? Raise your hand. It makes for some interesting conversations, does it not? Especially about origins, where did you come from? What is the meaning of life? What happens after you die? Uh, these are very important and prevalent questions in our culture today. But think about this, for the Christian, we do not negotiate these things because we believe that what God has given to us in His Word is just not partially true, but it is completely 100% true because it is based on the character of God and who He is. Man. Look at this passage in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see what Paul is saying? Paul is saying for the Christian, the ultimate authority that is sufficient for you is the Word of God. Now people say, you know what, yeah Dave, you know, I know you say that, but what about, what about my feelings? Uh, what about the way that I feel? What about these people? And we start to negotiate with God and say, yes, God, I trust you, but I'm not sure if I can completely trust your word. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy is in very dire circumstances. He's dealing with false prophets. He's dealing with people that are trying to ruin the church. Paul is saying, don't stand on your own merit. Stand on the word of God. Because it is true and you can believe it. Here's what I believe about the Word of God as I'm going to go through uh, this pa these passages this morning. Is that for the Christian, we have all the answers that we need in order to defend our faith. When you come across a conversation with a lost person, never should you be able to say, you know what, I'm not sure if the Bible addresses that. You and I can have absolute authority that God has given us everything that we need in order to explain things. Let, let's look at a couple of these this morning, and I pray that this truly does equip you uh, in reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first thing is this, is that the Bible affirms that there is a God who is responsible for the creation of all things. We start out with that statement. The Bible truly says that there is a God who is responsible for the creation of all things. What's the other worldview? The other worldview says, the atheistic, naturalistic says, we came about as a result of natural process, right? <clears throat> something started with something and began to start into something else, and eventually we all kind of ended up here. The Bible makes no such claim. The Bible says that there is a God who created all things. Let's look at the who of creation. Number one, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. God is outside of time. Do you know what God calls himself? He calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. That means he has always been and he will always be. That is a powerful statement. So the Bible clearly tells us the who of creation. But let's look at the what of creation. What did God do? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible clearly tells me that there is a creator, God, who put all things into existence. Folks, can I tell you, when I look at the nature today, and when I look at design, and when I look at the complexity of so many things, there is no way that I can look at that and say, this came about just randomly and set itself up perfectly. There was a God who created these things, so we know the what of creation. Now, how did God do it? This is always pretty controversial. Let, let's look at what God says He did in Genesis 1.31. God ends up creating everything that it says that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. How did creation come about? If you look at the Genesis narrative in chapter 1, God says over and over again, he uses the word let. Let there be light. Let this do this. Let this do this. How did God create all things? He did it by his spoken word. Now you say, wow, Dave, how in the world is that possible? I don't know, I am not God. Do you realize that when you look at all of us today, we, we are very minuscule in the totality of God's creation? Have you ever taken time to look at how big the universe is and you and I are just but a dot uh, that God has put on this planet? It is amazing what God has done. But God also tells us something else, is that He created everything in six days. And you say, well, Dave, there's a lot of issues with this, and, and we'll go over that. But clearly, over and over again in the Genesis narrative, what does God say? And the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. 
The Bible tells us clearly how God did it. He did it in six days. God does not need a long period of time. Think about this. If God can simply speak things into existence, He does not need time to favor Him in doing that task. So He creates all things in six days. And what else does God say about His creation? He says that it was very good. If you were to study the Hebrew behind it, it literally means it is a perfect creation. So here I get all the way in the beginning. There is a Creator God. He is perfect in His nature. He is holy. So anything that God creates must fit in with His nature, right? If, if God is perfect, then everything else that He does is perfect. If God is holy, everything that He requires in terms of worshiping Him must be holy as well. So number one, we find out the Bible affirms that there is a God who is responsible for all created things. But let's look at number two. The Bible gives us explanation regarding animals and plants. What does God say He does? He, he creates everything according to its kind. Now you say, Dave, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. Plants and animals were created to reproduce within the boundaries of their kind. And I'll show you an illustration here, okay? A couple of them. Let's look at the first one. Dogs can only breed with dogs. And what do you get? You don't get cats, okay? God made these kinds. So within a parent of the dog family, God put enough information to create within that family varieties. That's why you can have German Shepherds. That's why you can have Poodles. That, that's why you can have a multi pool like I have, who's not really even a dog. Uh, you know, so you can have all these different types of dogs, but they still fit within the dog kind. But you can have different species, at least in terms of different traits. But they all come from the same set of parents. Let's look at this. I did not even know there were chicken variations. You know, you go to Kroger and you pick up ch chicken and you see Tyson or Purdue and you're like, okay, that just won't. I didn't know there were all these. I'm thinking to myself, I'm a pretty sheltered individual. You know, what's going on here? I need to visit a farm. Uh, so there's the chickens, different, their same parents. Horses. These are just a few illustrations. So what does God do? He creates everything according to its kind. One set of parents to reproduce uh, over all the earth with different information within it. Folks, there is no way that you can crossbreed like this and get something else. Everything that you see, God has designed in a specific way. The Bible gives us an explanation regarding animals and plants. Why can we see that? Because there is a designer that put all these things together. Let's look at another thing. The Bible gives us the origin of humanity. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Do you realize what the secular world says? The secular world says that you and I, as human beings, are descendants of apes over a long evolutionary process. That's what they say. You know, you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, my kids act like monkeys sometimes, okay? Dave, you know, there's, there's got to be 1% truth to that. When they hit that one and a half year age, there is no limit to what they will destroy. Okay, we're going through that right now. You know, it's craziness. Trying to invite people over, it's messy within a few seconds. But think about what the Bible is telling you. Think about this. Every single bit of creation that God has created, God has said, let it be. Let this come into fruition. Let this come into fruition. But we're going to see when it comes to God making this, that He individually plans out the creation of human beings. So what is the implication behind this? Number one is this. We as human beings are the only creation not spoken into existence. Out of all the creation, God says, let it be, let it be, let this do this. But what does God do? If you read in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God takes mud and He puts this clay together and He forms man. He is the designer. You and I ought to think to ourselves, man, that is pretty special to think that God took some time in putting me together. I am His special design specifically created for His purpose. We're the only creation not spoken into existence. Number two, it also means that all human life matters. From the moment of conception all the way till the oldest age possible, all human life matters. 
and governments don't get to decide when human life matters. Your opinion, my opinion, does not matter. It is God that has given human value life. And that's why we must uphold it. Number three, humans have a conscience. Human beings have a conscience where God has put within our nature where we can determine what is right and wrong. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 says, Humanity is without excuse because God has made Himself evident through creation, but He has also put His law on man's heart. Do you realize I spoke with uh, Phil about when I was having a conversation about this. I said, Phil, you know, can you please tell me statistically, you know, do people ever just turn themselves in, you know, for committing crimes? He says that they do. He says, Dave, you would not believe the number one reason why people turn themselves in. The reason is because they have taken a human life. Why? If we don't have a conscience, why does that human being turn himself in for taking someone else's life? People will say, well, he was just trying to do a good deed. He was just trying to be a nice person. No, 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 no. The reason is because his conscience is convicting him because a holy God has put that within him to determine what is right and wrong. God has given humanity a conscience, but not just that. But there are special roles for genders, male and female. Have you seen in our culture today a war over women's rights and men's rights? Have you seen that? Isn't it amazing that the thing that is elevated the most is definitely not motherhood? Have you seen that? There is nothing wrong with motherhood. Matter of fact, I think it is awesome. It is what God has created and is good. And what you're seeing is this total a rebellion against God's created order where they say, you know what, moms who stay at homes, that's not good. If you need a husband, that's not good. You need to be independent and push these things. You're going, wait, who gave you such ideas? Who demeaned these roles? It definitely was not God. God has created these roles so that you can use them in the purpose of marriage to, to show and bring to glory the bride of Christ and the groom and to show people what it truly means. To be holy in your walk with God. So that's another implication. But here's something else is this. Is that racism ends up being wrong as well. Racism ends up being wrong. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 17. Excuse me, Luke. It says this, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Do you realize that you and I, every one of us here are descendants of Adam and Eve? scary, but we're kind of related. You think about it, you're related to me, kind of, sort of, right? We, human life matters. Why? Because we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. But see, if you were to take the atheistic worldview in their category, there are certain people groups that are lesser than others, and when you have seen racism in the past, it has been driven because of that worldview. But for the Christian, racism should not even exist because we understand where human life comes from, it comes from God, and we are all descendants of one set of parents. God is the creator of all human life. God also explains the different people groups around the world. The Bible explains this. Look at Genesis chapter 11. This is after Noah has landed after the flood, and God tells the people to scatter all over the earth. They disobey. Look at what it says. And the people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over all the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. Where in the world do all the people groups of the world come from? It is from this event. You also want to know where you, when people tell you stop babbling? There's your root word right there. Confusion, right? When you're babbling, you're confusing. Think about this. Why is this important? Because not only are we descendants of Adam and Eve, but the places that we have landed are simply a direct, we can trace it back to Genesis chapter 11. The people groups around the world. I think to myself, 
this is pretty amazing that I can see from a Christian worldview. I wonder about all these different people groups all around the world. I don't have to think about where it came from. God's Word tells me where they come from. That's what I mean when I say a Christian worldview. God scatters them over all the face of the earth. Not just that, but the Bible gives us the origin and definition of marriage. You hear this a lot in the world today, don't you? Look at Genesis 2.24. Look at what the Bible says. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Amen. Right? Guys, you got to leave your mom's side, at least for marriage, okay? you got to take care of her and stuff. But, but God says, go, get married. And then Jesus repeats it in Matthew 19. He says, answered and said to him, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Here's the problem that we have in our culture today, is that we as Christians are trying to fight this issue on a political front. Right? We're saying if I donate a certain amount of dollars to this campaign, these guys are going to fight for this issue. Folks, the origin of marriage, we're not talking about traditional marriage. We're talking about the idea of biblical marriage. It is God that has put this idea of a man and a woman coming together to form what's called a marriage. And so people will never truly understand the true meaning of marriage until they understand it from a Christian worldview. You can sit there throwing dollar upon dollar upon these political issues, but until people truly understand that the Word of God has dictated this, they will not understand the importance of this issue. I'm telling you right now, and I've said it before, in the next 10 to 15 years, it might even be sooner, but don't be surprised if gay marriages legalize across the entire country. Get ready for it. It's going to happen. How are you going to defend your faith? You know, I read a book, and, and it's radically changed my life, and I'm going to explain this in the next few weeks or so coming up. It's a book called The Great Evangelical Recession. And he talks about the church in America in general and, and how it's getting busted up big time. But here's what he says. He says one of the things that the church is going to have to look out for is he says they're going to have to look out for this issue of homosexual marriage. Because if you start to try and, you know, uh, counsel people that are struggling with these desires, he says they're going to start to outlaw that because it's seen as discrimination. Not only that, but for the Christians who believe that homosexuality behavior, that behavior is wrong, who believe the concept of that marriage is wrong, they're going to say that those people have a mental disorder. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised in the next 10 to 15 years if churches lose their tax-exempt status and have to pay taxes. Here's where my standing is. I lose the tax-exempt status because I want to teach the truth of God's Word. Right. Never has the church been afforded protection and privilege like it has been in the United States of America, but we might see those days disappear. What are you going to do? Are you going to run away or are you going to stand up for the truth of God's Word? We find out the words in the definition of marriage. Here's something else when you're talking to people. The Bible explains the problem of evil. Why is there so much death and suffering and evil in the world today? How could a loving God do such things? Remember, God had created a perfect creation. Look at Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He questioned God's word. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her. He's standing right there. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. What is the origin? Where is the problem of evil? Where does it come from? It comes from the two sets of parents. The first set of parents 
where God said, eat of everything except for this, for in the day that you do, you will surely die. They disobeyed God. See, the, the evolutionists, the atheists, the people that don't believe in God, they can't explain the problem of evil because if you don't have a foundation to what you believe, your behavior, my behavior, who gets to decide whether it's right or wrong? If I'm the one that gets to decide truth and not God, I can do whatever I want and no one can hold me accountable. But if there is a God who has said there is right and wrong, I am accountable ultimately to Him and will have to face Him on Judgment Day. What you believe really does matter. I decided to put this next point as a side note, but it's still important. Why do women have pain during labor? Ladies, do you realize that labor was supposed to be pain-free? No amens. Okay. Uh, look at what, what happens here. They disobey God. Look at one of the things that God says to them. It says, to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Stop blaming your husbands. It's Eve's fault, okay? <laughs> you know, I remember, uh, I think, like, the first or second child, like, you know, Kristen was in labor. She had to eat for, like, 18 hours. I was hungry. I decided to go to the cafeteria, get some pizza, burger, fries. And I was eating right in front of her. She didn't appreciate it. My excuse, I want to have enough strength, don't want to faint, be there, you know, for the baby to come through, right? Guys, right? Okay, one guy, all right. Uh, now I'm in trouble, all right. But, but think about this. The Bible has an answer for these things. Why do these things take place? Not just that, but look at this. Because of Adam's sin, all humans are born with this sin nature. You and I are born with a sin nature. What does that mean? We have a natural disposition towards sin. That means sin comes naturally to me. I can sin pretty easily. I don't struggle with sin. You know, I'm not struggling with issues of whether I should sin or not. It comes easily for me. If you want to lie, it's pretty easy. If you want to gossip, it's easy. If it's adultery, it's easy. Sin comes naturally to me. Why? Because the first parent sinned and I was born with a sin nature that loves to sin. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For me, the Christian worldview, where does this come from? It comes from the fact that the first parents, they sinned, they fell in their walk with God, and now I have a sin nature that loves to sin. Hey, I'll give you a great side note. You know, earlier I showed you that banner of coexist. How many of you have ever taken time to study uh, the religion of Islam? Anyone here? Okay. Here's what's interesting. Now, Randy, you got to edit this part, okay? I was reading the Quran last night, all right? got to say that. <laughs> I'm in Southeast India. You're like, what in the world's going on? It's for study purposes. There are verses. Here's what Muslims believe about this, okay? Muslims, if you look at the Quran, they have a similar account of Adam and Eve. They have a similar account of God saying, don't do this, do this. Here's the only problem. Muslims believe that Allah had basically, when Adam and Eve sinned, they asked God for forgiveness. God gives them forgiveness, and He does not continue on this concept of original sin. Therefore, there is no natural disposition to sin. Therefore, they are not born with a sin nature. Do you see how significant that is? The Bible tells us that every single human being that has ever been born after Adam and Eve's fall is born with a sin nature. For the Muslim, that concept is not there. And here's something else. The Muslims also believe, if you were to read in the Quran, that Adam and Eve are not necessarily historical figures, but they're simply allegorical figures explaining the struggle of humanity. Do you see what happens when you take away the foundation of God's Word, you have difficulty explaining the world around you. When I see things from a Christian worldview and suffering and disease and pain and death, I can see that it is traced right back to God's Word and man's disobedience. Look at this concept of natural disposition to see in Galatians 5. Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revel, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, 
just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does your flesh like to do? All of those things multiplied by a hundred. But then he also encourages us in the passage, but those who live according to the flesh, or excuse me, or walk according to the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and all these other traits that are consistent with God's character. Hey, look at something else here as we move along. The Bible also explains the formation of terrain around the world. Well, Dave, what are you talking about? How many of you have ever been out to the West? Anyone here? Grand Canyons? It's absolutely spectacular. One of the best flights that I've ever taken was from Phoenix. I flew over the canyons and then landed in Salt Lake City. It was absolutely spectacular. And to see what had happened. But what is my explanation for that? What caused that? Look at Genesis chapter 7. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. What are you speaking about, Dave? What in the world are you talking about? Yes, I'm talking about a global flood. But have you ever taken time to study the continents around the world? Look, look at this picture here. Look on the far left of the screen. This is possibly what the world, the original world, looked like before the flood came. And the Bible says here that the fountains of the deep broke open. And there you see the splitting up of where we have the continents all around the world. If you were to take all the continents of the world today, you could put them back perfectly. And they would possibly form what's on the far left. How do I explain the world around me? How do I explain these continents that have drifted away? I can look back at an event that caused worldwide destruction, and I can say the Word of God is true. Folks, you should have confidence in the Word of God. You should say, man, not only is it tell me how I should love Jesus and be holy, but I can trust that history that is there. Because when I look at the world, the Bible absolutely makes sense in what it describes. How about this? The Bible also explains the fossils that are found all over the world. Why are there fossils around the world? Look at Genesis chapter 7. It says the waters prevailed. This is the flood waters, 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing, and the bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him the ark remain alive. Grand Canyon explains it full of fossils. People have always said, well, Dave, no way in the world could a global flood have caused that. Dave, there is no way in the world. This has got to be billions and millions of years old. You guys remember when Mount St. Helens erupted? Do you realize how many layers it laid down in a very quick amount of time? You know, I don't need millions of years because Mount St. Helens proves to me that this can happen in a very short amount of time. Matter of fact, in a few days, why not a global flood that covered the entire face of the earth? I can look at the Grand Canyon from a Christian worldview and I have an answer to my faith in defending the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, I'll close with these three points here, which I think are even more important. And I, and I hope they strike a nerve in your heart because I, I believe it really has implications for understanding how much God truly loves us. Here's what the Bible also does is that Bible reveals the identity of the Creator. It reveals the identity of the Creator. Look at Colossians 1, 15-17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in the heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, and all things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. Folks, not only is your Savior Jesus Christ, not only is He the one that saves you and redeems you, but He is also the Creator that you read about in Genesis. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. The author of Hebrews says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, 
through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Think about how powerful that is. Jesus Christ, who has always existed, who will always exist, is the one who is the creator of all things. Folks, that, that's pretty powerful. But what does he do? We, we have the identity of the creator, but what is the work of the creator? For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Can you imagine this picture for a second? The God of the universe that we read about in Genesis, the New Testament tells us that the power has been given to the second person of the Trinity, who is Jesus Christ, fully God, and He becomes man, He puts on flesh, and He comes and dies for you and I. Why would you do such a thing? God, you're so powerful, man. You spoke all these things into existence. You made everything perfect. Who in the world is man that you would love him so much that you would send yourself to die on their behalf? Imagine the Savior on the cross as they're nailing, putting nails on his side, and his hands, and his feet. Crown of thorns on his head. They pierce his side. Can you imagine what is going on in his mind? This is not the way it was supposed to be. This is not how I created things to be. But yet he humbled himself so much that he would subject himself to that type of torture on your behalf and my behalf. And that we would have eternal life. A Christian worldview, absolutely powerful. Not only that, but the Bible, and I close with this point, reveals the way to the Creator. And it's pretty simple. It is grace through faith. It is grace through faith. You should have these two verses memorized. I'm sure you do. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That is a Christian worldview. There is no amount of good works that you can do to inherit God's blessing and eternal life. Do you realize the Muslim today, as he sits today, can have absolutely no assurance whether he's going to heaven or not? For the Muslim, when he stands before God one day, if his good works happen to outweigh his bad works, he might have the possibility of entering into heaven. Do you want to take that chance? Because I know which way the scales would tip on my behalf. They would be so lopsided, it's not even funny, but I thank God for His grace, that when He died for me, when I trusted Him through faith, that when I stand before Him, guess what? I stand perfect. Amen. You ever consider yourself perfect? If you have the nature of Jesus Christ right now through faith, you stand before God perfect. Amen? Amen. That is pretty awesome. We have assurance through God's Word, it is a Christian worldview, that no matter how much good you try to do to inherit or to merit God's favor, it is only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that makes it possible for us. And I close with this last point, is that Christianity is the only worldview where God comes down to man for the purpose of reconciliation. It is the only worldview out there today. Everybody's just basing it on chance and the maybes and possibilities. I can go to God's Word because I have the guarantee. There is an infinite gap between God and us. Infinite. But what does God do in His love and mercy? God decides to come down to us even to the point where He would become a human being like you and I and go die on the cross on our behalf for the purpose of reconciliation. The rest of the world has no hope. They try to find it in happiness. You know, they try to find it in materialism. They try to find it in relationships. 
You will not find it unless you find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, He says, I give unto them joy and I give it to them abundantly. I give unto them life. Stay connected to me. Here's a question for you this morning. Are you able to defend your faith? Many of you may say, Dave, you know, I haven't really taken my time to study these things. And, you know, many people have asked me these questions and I really haven't been able to answer them. Folks, if God's word is true, as the Apostle Paul said, all scripture, if God's word is truly true, then why don't I use it? Why don't I read it? Why don't I meditate on it? Why don't I share with full confidence the gospel of Jesus Christ? Folks, there's lost people all around us. All, all around us. We have opportunity every single day to share the love of Jesus Christ, but we can also share the love of Jesus Christ because the foundation of God's word is true. It stands on its own merit because there's a perfect God that has given it to us. I pray that just in these few moments of invitation that you would make a commitment to trust God, to open up opportunities to share the love of Jesus Christ. Folks, people are on their way to hell for eternity. You and I are going the other way. Can we not share the hope of Jesus with them? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for those who could make it because of the weather, Father, in spite of the weather, that you have protected us and preserved us, and we thank you for that. Father, I thank you just for these few moments where we've had the chance to praise you because you truly do deserve the praise and glory. You are worthy of all the worship, Father, especially from us because you have redeemed us. When we could have absolutely been separated from you for eternity, you reconciled us to yourself through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And now we trust us in his victory as he sits at the right hand of the Father. Father, I pray in these few moments we would make a commitment to share the gospel with that one lost person in our life. And we would not pass up any more opportunities or make any more excuses, Father. You want us to share Jesus with them. Lord, would you give us the opportunity? And Father, for those who just don't have confidence in their faith, Lord, or are struggling, Lord, pray that you would renew them with this message to trust you with all of their heart. Speak to our hearts, Lord, just in these few moments. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed, eyes closed, just in these few moments. Pray that God would burden you to share Jesus Christ with that one lost person in your life. Just one person. That's all he asks, one person, just this week. Pray that God gives you opportunity. moments and Don, Don, if you can please come up and uh, pray for us. Um, remember our Bible study on Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening. If you guys could please come out for that. would be uh, greatly appreciated as we continue studying God's Word. And then February the 21st is Winter Jam. If you're interested in going, the cost is only $10. Uh, I would strongly encourage you uh, to do so. Uh, let's stay this morning as we dismiss with a word of prayer. Don, if you can uh, please close this out. Uh, we appreciate this morning. Lord Jesus, we do thank you uh, for your word, Lord. We thank you so much that you have reconciled us with the Father, Lord. And we just pray that each one of us might grasp this truth and hold it tight, Lord, that, that you've taken our sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, uh, you've taken away the enmity that is between us. And Lord, we just want to praise you for what you've done. And Lord, help us to uh, give our... our worldview from, from you, Lord, from the truth, Lord. You said you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, help us, uh, Lord, to be able to deal with those around us, Lord. Help us to see their need. Help us to be burdened <coughs> burden. And, and Lord, uh, you, know, you might use us to speak to others and reach out for you. And uh, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.